Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Nicolette Martin, and I'm the National Director for Health and Human Services for the Lynx Incorporated. This evening, we have an amazing program for you. We're going to start off with a brief conversation by our national president and a very esteemed guest, and then we will move on to our panel discussion where we have noted uh, deans as well as policymakers. We have a lot of information for you, so please stand by. I'd like to start this evening with speaking about our national president. Dr. Kimberly Jeffries Leonard is the 17th national president of the Lynx Incorporated and the Lynx Foundation Incorporated. Dr. Jeffries Leonard was recently appointed by the DC mayor, Muriel Bowser, to serve as chair on the Commission on African American Affairs, and most recently to serve on the Reopen DC Advisory Group and Reopen DC Task Force on equity, disparity reduction, and vulnerable populations and subcommittees. Dr. Jeffries Leonard is the president and CEO of Envision Consulting and has over 30 years experience in applied health and behavioral medicine, research, evaluation, and training experience, specializing in health and promotion and disease prevention. Dr. Leonard received her PhD in psychology from Howard University her master's in psychology from North Carolina Central, and her BS in psychology from Fayetteville State University. She also completed um, a National Institute of Minority Health pre-doctoral fellowship at the George Washington University Medical School, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Jeffries Leonard is a recipient of the Equal Opportunity in Higher Education Alumni of the Year Award, the AARP, African American Changemaker Award, the Women in Excellence Reaching Higher, Higher Award by the Afro-American Newspaper, and many, many others. Dr. Leonard is married <clears throat> to retired Chief Battalion Stephen B. Leonard, and they are, have two sons living here in Washington, D.C., Victor and Alexander. Good evening, Dr. Leonard. Good evening, Dr. Martin. Good evening. Thank you so so much for that introduction. I'm so very excited about this town hall tonight because it's going to be able to shed a little bit of light on some of those things that in the era of COVID that we've been a little apprehensive about. And so we do have a phenomenal panel coming up to have a conversation about some of these issues around oral health. But I have the opportunity, I have the pleasure and the honor of having a conversation with Dr. Lewis Sullivan. Uh, this is a man who truly needs no introduction, but I am going to provide one to you so you know uh, who we're talking to tonight. And he and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the things that he's done from a visionary standpoint and why they're so important now, especially in this era of COVID. So as I said to you, we have the opportunity to speak to Dr. Lewis, Lewis Sullivan. He is the chairman of the Washington DC based Sullivan Alliance to transform the health professions. This is a national nonprofit organization that has a community focused agenda to diversify and transform health professions, education and health delivery systems. Now he has so many honors and awards, but there are a couple that I want to tell you about. He served as the chair of the president's commission on historically black colleges and universities from 2002 to 2009. And he was the co-chair of the President's Commission on HIV and AIDS from 2001 to 2006. With the exception of his tenure as US Department and Health and Human Services Secretary. So he was the secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services from 1989 to 1983. With the exception of that, he was the, the president of Morehouse School of Medicine which is the first predominantly black medical school established in the 21st century, the 20th century for more than two decades. Now, even though he retired on July 1st, 2002, he was appointed president emeritus. He was the founder of Morehouse School of Medicine. He became the founding dean and director of the medical education program at Morehouse College in 1975, which in turn became the Morehouse School of Medicine, which he founded. So there's so many things to be able to say about Dr. Sullivan, but what I want to be able to do is to really take this time and have a conversation so that you all can hear um, this Atlanta native, this connect, he is a husband of a link, um, and, and, and to talk about his vision, 
um, for the Sullivan Alliance, where we are now with COVID, and where he thinks we are going to be moving forward. So I'm so very pleased to welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan, thank you for joining us tonight. My pleasure, Dr. Leonard, to be with you and your fellow LINK members. Oh, we're, we're so excited. And this was such an important conversation that not only are we in, uh, had invited our LINK members, but we've invited our whole community uh, globally to be able to hear not only what you have to say, but really to ask questions and, and, and really reap the benefit of your knowledge. So, so tell me, Dr. Sullivan, if we can just kind of get into it. I know that you were the founder of, of Morehouse School of Medicine, and we're going to talk about some of the things that you've done since in the Sullivan Alliance. But I know there are many of us want to under, want to hear what was your vision and how you came to be the founder of Morehouse School of Medicine. Well, that came about because of a number of things. First of all, I'm a native Atlantan, having been born at Grady Hospital, but my parents moved to rural Southwest Georgia when I was about age four. In Southwest Georgia, there was one black physician 41 miles south of where we lived. My parents, when they needed medical care, would drive 41 miles to visit Dr. Griffin rather than suffer the indignity of having to go around back into a separate waiting room at a white physician's office. I got to know Dr. Griffin. I was very impressed with him. He was highly respected. He possessed what I felt were magical powers uh, and he could cure people. So by age five, I told my parents, I want to be like Dr. Griffin. So he was my first role model. I went to fin back to Atlanta to high school, finished Booker Washington High, and on to Morehouse College, which had a very strong pre-medical program. I was inspired there by its president, Dr. Benjamin Mays, who was an inspiration to all of the students there. From there, I went to Boston University School of Medicine, and that was in 1954, and I was the one black student in my class of 76 students. At age 21, that was my first experience living in a non-segregated environment. I had a great experience there, learned a lot. Of course, my classmates had, first, had finished first in their class, or second or third at Amherst, Middlebury, Princeton, Harvard, and I wondered how would I do coming from Morehouse? Well, our first examination settled that because I re received a very good score on that examination. I then relaxed and had a great experience in medical school. And then 1958, in New York, for the first time, Cornell Medical Center had its first black intern, that was me. And I mentioned wow. that because uh, our major city in the country with all of its sophistication it was not, not until 1958 that they had their first black house officer. Well, to make a long story short, I became professor of medicine at Boston University and chief of hematology at Boston City Hospital, when my college, alma mater, Morehouse College decided they wanted to start a medical school. Mm -hmm. This was during a period of expansion of medical education. Many people thought this was really a wild idea that would go nowhere. But the president of Morehouse College at that time, Hugh Glasser was very committed. And I was recruited back to Atlanta in 1975 mm -hmm. because my experience growing up in Georgia and my experience in medical school and as a house officer at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center made it very clear that there were not enough black physicians in the country. So when the opportunity came to go back to Morehouse and start a medical school, I took it. We had uh, a lot of great experiences. I won't take the time to go into them, except to say, I'm proud of what our graduates have done so far. We've created, we've had a U.S. Surgeon General, Benjamin, uh, 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 Regina Benjamin, who mm -hmm. finished. Uh, the current president of Downstate Medical Center, Dr. Wayne Riley, is a graduate of Morehouse. We have had a number of our students going into rural areas and into primary care, bringing uh, health care needed uh, in those areas. So I'm very proud of that. And that work continues. We still need a lot of efforts around the country. And that's what animates me. And that's what we're working to try and do, even in my, quote, retirement years. Wow, that you know, it, it's it's um, it's it's such interesting history to hear you talk about your vision and 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 it's, and it's, and and how you came to to be want to be a physician, how you came to to go to 
um, Morehouse and how you came to be the founder of Morehouse School of Medicine. And one of the things that, that, I've, that I've noticed in, in not only in this particular conversation, but in, in a number of the conversations we've had is a recurring theme. And that is really to ensure that we have who we need to be able to serve the community. Is that the reason why you started the Sullivan Alliance? What was your vision for that? Yes, the, there were a number of reasons for starting the Sullivan Alliance. Uh, I would say our nation from its founding has always uh, discriminated against African-Americans. Uh, for example, the first medical schools in the United States were founded in Philadelphia and in New York uh, in the 1700s, in 1760 and in 1770. But the first medical schools in the country to admit blacks, uh, that occurred in a uh, hundred years later, around uh, 1847, 1850. Uh, the first students admitted to Harvard were discharged by the Dean after one year because of the protests of the white students. Mm -hmm. The first black medical school, as you know, was Howard University mm -hmm. in 1868, followed by Meharry in 1876. So from the beginning, uh, our nation has always had a problem and it still has a problem. We are working towards uh, changing that, but the work continues, it is needed. And so that is really what has inspired me because I do, do believe in the nation's creed that all men are created equal and have an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> We're working towards that, but we as a nation have never uh, lived up fully to that. Mm -hmm. And I want to be sure that uh, not only African-Americans, but Hispanics, Native Americans and others, all of us one day fully participate in the, nation, in the nation's creed. We will be a better country for that. And that's why I do the things that I do, working towards that ideal. So is that your vision for the Sullivan Alliance, to be able to ensure that we have um, across um, this country and globally, those trained um, health workers of color. Tell us a little bit about your vision and, 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 and the Sullivan Alliance in general. Yes, well, uh, in 1950, the middle of the 20th century, 2% of the nation's physicians were African-American mm -hmm. when we represented 10% of the nation's population. We expanded as a nation our medical education enterprise we went from 80 medical schools in 1950 to 127 medical schools by 1981. We doubled the number of medical students graduating uh, from 8,000 annually from all of the nation's medical schools in 1950 to a little bit more than 16,000 in 1981. Mm -hmm. We went from 2% of those students entering in 1950 were African-American, primarily at Howard and Meharry, to some 5% uh, by 1981. We're, we're now up to 8%, but African Americans represent 13% of the nation's population now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you look at the other minority populations in the United States, you see similar figures. The Hispanic community does not have enough physicians. Native American community does not. Now, I firmly believe that uh, health care should be uh, given by any and all physicians. There shouldn't be the need to identify them, but the reality is uh, we don't have enough. And if we're going to serve those areas of the country that have high po populations of African-Americans or Latino-Americans or Native Americans, mm -hmm. the reality, we have to have more physicians from those population groups. Mm -hmm. So until we reach that ideal, we need to focus on having a more equitable distribution of our nation's health professionals comparable to their representation in the general population. Mm -hmm. That will ensure that we receive the care that we need, that we have an educated population in terms of a healthy behavior, the things that individuals can do and must do themselves to protect their health. And it also means we'll have advocates within the system for having those things such as health insurance, facilities, equitable treatment, to see that people receive the care that they need so that the health status of our citizens will be equal, which it is not today. 
you know, that that is um, an important note that the, the, the health status of our citizens would be equal, which it is not today. You know, it really has kind of we, we knew this all along and we've always known this. But in COVID, it has been so prominently uh, we, we've seen it so prominently, and we know that um, the disparities and the inequities that we've seen in our communities in COVID is really just reflective of what we've always known. How important is the Sullivan Alliance mission, especially now in this era of COVID? Oh, it is uh, more urgent than ever, because as you've noted, the COVID pandemic has unmasked for the general public the realities that those of us in the health professions have worked with all along. And now that the public is much more aware of this, hopefully we will be able to translate that awareness into stronger public support to see that we have more equitable distribution of health professionals in our nation. We have in increased health insurance um, with the nation's poor and minority populations. Uh, the bias in the system hopefully will be eliminated so all of those things uh, we, we hope to, to happen. And we need to do everything ourselves to see that we are adequately represented in the health system and that uh, the patients whom we represent receive the health that they should receive in an equitable, non-biased setting. Tell me, I, I think, you know, we, we, we know how important that is. And, and, and we know that now, um, you know, you you did your work at Morehouse. I did my work at three HBCUs, uh, Fayetteville State University, North Carolina Central, and Howard University. How important is, is the work of our HBCUs and what is the role of the Sullivan Alliance as it relates to these H our HBCUs? Oh, our nation's historically black colleges and universities have played a very important role in providing educational opportunities for our nation's uh, black uh, citizens and they continue in that role uh, significantly. A very high percentage of the nation's physicians, uh, engineers, business persons, uh, and in other fields have been graduates of our nation's HBCUs. It's still not enough. Of the more than 4,000 colleges and universities in the country, there are approximately 103 black colleges and universities. So the numbers are small and they tend to be smaller institutions. So all of the institutions in the country, white or black, really have a responsibility to address this. But our nation's HBCUs have really been the beacons of hope uh, and opportunity for our citizens. And all of us, including uh, my own life, these uh, opportunities were available that I was able to develop uh, and become a physician and have the opportunity of developing Morehouse School of Medicine or becoming Secretary of Health in human services. So our nation's HBCUs are invaluable institutions. They should be strengthened uh, because the role that they play is still needed and I fully support uh, them uh, and commend them for the work that they have done over the years. Well, I am, um, it, it is very exciting to me to hear about how we are, you know, the Sullivan Alliance is, is, is you know, elevating HBCUs, but not just HBCUs, but, um, health professionals of color and in our country, because that is truly what we need. So as we close our conversation, because we do have another panel, how can the Lynx Incorporated support the work of the Sullivan Alliance? Well, the Lynx are a very important, uh, highly regarded, very effective organization of leaders, of women uh, in the professions uh, and in positions of influence. My own wife, uh, Ginger, who's the Lynx, mm -hmm. Uh, these friends of the Sullivan, friends of Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for scholarships to help us uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine. My daughter also is a link uh, in Los Angeles. So indeed, uh, I'm fully aware of the important work uh, and the very uh, inspiring work that the links do. What you have that is so important uh, is knowledge of the community, leadership in the community and trust in the community. And the COVID pandemic is a good example because one of the problems we have now is lack of trust in the health system or mm -hmm. in the COVID mm -hmm. vaccine. So people turn to people they know and they trust when they are uncertain. This is where the links can, can be, be helpful. 
Also, because the Sullivan Alliance um, in the states in which we're operating, which by the way, are Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, uh, and Virginia and Nebraska, and we mm -hmm. want to expand uh, to as many states as, as we can. So if we are able to work with the links, this would uh, help us in our efforts to reach other states because we have the needs, whether they're in California or, or New Mexico uh, or Louisiana or what have you. So if we're able to work with the links, you would bring uh, an element that we don't have. You have roots in the cities around the country. You have a commitment to service and to leadership and improving the community. And you have the trust of the community uh, in the work that you do. So we want to inspire young people to uh, come into the health professions. You could help inspire uh, those young people as I was inspired by Dr. Griffin when I was age, age five. And you could help educate uh, citizens on improving their health behavior so they will do such things as not smoke, uh, not drink to ex excess, have regular checkups, uh, exercise regularly, a whole host of things. So I would see a range of uh, possibilities uh, if we were working uh, with the links. Well, Dr. Sullivan, just as you were inspired, we are inspired by you. And so we look forward to our next steps as an organization working with you to inspire that next generation to ensure that we are addressing some of the disparities that we see and that we elevate those careers that are needed to ensure that we change, we move the needle in our communities. So thank you for taking the time for this intimate conversation. And to our audience, there'll be more to come. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator, Nikki Taylor, Nikki Martin, Nikki. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard and Dr. Sullivan. Uh, we really appreciate you kicking this off and thank you, Dr. Sullivan, Sullivan for all that information. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to continue with our conversation. This is the National Oral Health Town Hall, Oral Health Matters During COVID and Beyond. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel. Uh, if we were in person, I would say, please hold your applause. These uh, panelists have very, very long resumes. They are all extremely, extremely competent, extremely accomplished. And so I'm not going to read all of their accolades because you wouldn't get to hear what they have to say, but I am gonna start off with some of the highlights. <clears throat> our first speaker is Dr. Jean Craig Sinkford. Dr. Singford is a renowned dental educator, administrator, researcher, and clinician. She finished first in her dental class in 1958 at Howard University before pursuing graduate studies at the North Northwestern University where she received a master's and a PhD. Dr. Singford became the first female dean of a dental school in the United States in 1975. She served in that capacity from 1975 to 1991. She has served on numerous committees and advisory boards, uh, too many really to count. Uh, she has more than 100 articles that have been published and has written instructional manuals for the Crown and Bridge Prostodontics. From 1992 to 2012, Dr. Singford was responsible for the diversity program and initiatives at the American Dental Education Association. She holds many, many honor honorary degrees, including ones from Howard University, uh, Georgetown University, and Meharry Medical College. In 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2017, Dr. Singford received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American College of Dentists, and she is a lifetime member in the American Dental Association and was elected to lifetime membership in the National Dental Association in 2012. Please welcome Dr. Jean Craig Singford. Next is Dr. Sheree Farmer Dixon. Dr. Farmer Dixon has overcome many, many barriers, becoming the third woman to head the School of Dentistry at the Meharry Medical College. She remains one of the few select women to have a leading role as a dean of a dental program that produces 40% of the nation's currently practicing African-American dentists. Prior to assuming the role of dean, Dr. Farmer Dixon was the associate dean for academic and student affairs at Meharry School of Dentistry. She also proudly serves as a 
our country as a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army Reserve. She is the Dean and an academic scholar who immerses herself in, <clears throat> in published research activities dealing with oral health disparities, caries in low-income children, and community outreach. She works tirelessly to address these disparities within the minority dental school enrollment. She's received a myriad of awards. Most recently, she was selected to lead a team of volunteers at the COVID-19 testing site at Meharry. Uh, she's also has been chosen as a national as, by the National Business Journal as one of the 2019 Women of Influence. She is, is a distinguished 2019 alum of the National Healthcare Council of Fellows. Welcome Dr. Sheree Farmer-Dixon. Dr. Pamela Alston. Dr. Alston is the 97th president of the National Dental Association whose mission is to promote oral health equity among people of color by harnessing the collective power of its members, advocating for the needs of and mentoring dental students of color and raising the profile of their, of their profession in our community. Dr. Alston graduated from the University of California, San, San Francisco with a BS and a DDS degree. She earned her undergraduate degree in economics and a master's in public policy from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Alston currently is a lead oral health specialist for the Department of Labor. She also volunteers as the Associate Health Science Professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Dentistry. Her areas of expertise are motivational interviewing, early oral care, and health literacy. Among her awards are included UCSF School of Dentistry Medal of Honor, <clears throat> induction into the Alameda County Women's Hall of Fame, uh, and the uh, New, York's, New York University School of Dentistry's Michael Alfonto Award for Diversity. Dr. Olson is a native of Oakland, California. She serves there on the City of Oakland Sugar and Sweetened Beverage Dis Distributors Tax Community Advisory Board. Please welcome Dr. Alston. <clears throat> Dr. Andrea Jackson. Dr. Jackson received her, B her DDS from Howard University College of Dentistry, a general practice residency certificate from Howard University Hospital, and a certificate and master's of science in prosthodontics from Georgetown University School of Dentistry. Dr. Jackson was appointed Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, where she served for six years before being appointed as Interim Dean. She was then appointed Dean to the College of Dentistry after one year. Dr. Jackson is a diplomat of the American Board of Prosthodontics, a fellow of the American College of Prosthodontics, and the American College of Dentists, and the International College of Dentists. Uh, she is a past member of the Joint Commission on National Dental Board Examinations, Prostodontics Test Construction Committee, and currently is on the Commission of Dental Accreditation and the Commission on Dental Competency Assessments. Please welcome Dr. Andrea Jackson. Ms. Donna Michelle Fields is the Director of Operations and Community Outreach for Colgate Palmolive Company's Bright Smiles, Bright Futures for North America. For the past 23 years, She's managed the company's integrated dental health awareness initiative that is targeted at children and families. She utilizes her skills and expertise to access more than 20 million children annually on behalf of Colgate. Ms. Fields is currently the National Vice President of the National Negro College of Women. <clears throat> She's a board member of the Black Women's Agenda and a member of the Westchester County, New York chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Her other uh, experiences include Vice President of Event Marketing for GW&J Marketing Communications at Western Union, Manager of Public Relations and Public Affairs for the New York Daily News, and Director of Public Relations at Circulation Expertise. She is a graduate of Fordham University and spends time with her family in rural Virginia and North Carolina. Please welcome Ms. Donna Fields. <clears throat> Dr. 
So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for all my speakers. I'd like to start with Dr. Singford. Um, Dr. Singford, as the Lynx Incorporate celebrate Oral Health Month and Women's History, we are delighted to welcome you again as the first female dean of a dental school, which makes you a true trailblazer in the field of dentistry. Please share with us some of the changes that you have seen and your views on minorities in dentistry and the increase in women in the dental profession. Good evening and thank you. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to be invited to speak today. I'm proud to have been a link for 50 years now. So it does, and sometimes my voice is very difficult to hear, but I hope that you can hear me. One of the biggest challenges that I have seen in the dental profession is the increase in women. When I entered dental school, there were only 2% women in dentistry in the country, and we weren't wanted in the profession, and we certainly were not admitted to dental schools. So when I was, the students asked me, why did I want to be a dean? I had been the dean of the College of Dentistry for eight years, as I had been the associate dean before I became the dean. And so when the dean left, it, the vacancy was something that was a national uh, tragedy because there were no individuals in the pipeline for leadership. And I, one of two schools in the country had um, a female associate dean. So I had studied long. I really wanted to be a researcher. I wanted to I studied so long, I got my dental degree, I got my PhD because I wanted to be a member of the graduate faculty of the university. And I became the only dental uh, faculty member that was also a member of the graduate faculty at Howard. So I was able to be, I was able to leave. I had read the largest department in the College of Dentistry. And I saw the vision of Howard University growing as the profession grew. Now my challenge in your, I, I see in, dentist, in dentistry today is getting the public to understand the relationship of oral health to systemic health. We, we, know, we know that all disease uh, and, and, and heart disease, lung disease, cancer, all of those, those basic um, elements that contribute uh, what we call the comorbidities between the systems are, are present. And so as, and as we look at the pandemic now, that brings to mind the public, the public that raises the public's attention toward the fact that, hey, we've been looking at oral health as dentistry and we've been looking at it as teeth and not as oral health, a system that is connected to other systems in the body. And so when I did my, my postgraduate work, I was working with the with the kidney and, and the brain, and people didn't understand what I was trying to do, but I was dealing with the steroids, and all of those have, have, have penetrated medicine and medical therapies throughout the time that I've been, been a dentist. But I, I do think that the profession offers a great opportunity for women. We, we don't have to be the, the, the stressed people that they thought we need. Extraction of teeth is a technique. I and mean, that can be taught to us and we can do it very well. We now have women oral surgeons. That, that was one of the areas that I had difficulty getting women into because it was such a, a knit uh, uh, group of people and, they, and there were only a few positions available for entry. So the narrowness, the ability to get them there was uh, very difficult. The other thing I did, uh, when I left Howard University at an early period because they had an early retirement, and I'd been a dean for 16 years, I'd done what I had planned to do. We'd added the new, new programs. They had added a new uh, fourth and fifth floor to the facility. We had expanded programs to the communities and all the things that I uh, made us competitive with the other schools because they were looking at Howard and Meharry for, for the, the major production of minority or black, black practitioners. So we really had to compete for recruitment. And so that was one of the big things that we did. Also, we developed a sophisticated recruitment program for going to the communities, talking to the schools, and, and not only just identifying for recruitment, but a retention and graduation program all the way through. And that program, the, the, uh, the graduates around the country understand 
what the process was because it was made available. But my only uh, track was uh, because we had a few funds at Howard to train uh, uh, faculty members. We could go to any school in the country for advanced training. And I was lucky to have had a Louise Ball fellowship. One woman left her money to Howard and Howard has used that money over the years before we had graduate fellowships uh, available to train faculty in the various specialty areas. Then we had to find the schools who would admit us you know, because we weren't being admitted to box schools. I was the first to every one place I went. I was the only woman to every place I went. But that didn't bother me because my mother had already told me that it's, a, it's not easy being a woman if you're interested in the health profession because they, they exclude you in this country. But when I looked at, uh, abroad, they had more women in the health profession. They weren't in the leadership roles, but they certainly were admitted to the program so that they were brought visible across those, uh, those uh, programs. And so the last thing that I really, um, uh, really am very proud, and I think uh, the, the whole the profession has to really look at is our role in international health, and that and the and the pandemic situation has brought that to our attention because now we we were ahead. We had the first international women's leadership program in 1999 at at at, uh, at Adia, and I I used the dental schools. To uh, as, a, as a pilot because we asked them to send those women abroad so that they could understand what was going on in other countries and the relevancy to our research development, uh, to the disease patterns that we're developing, the translational research which we were trying to move into. And so we, we had a lead there, which I still think that we maintain because we still, those women that had that first opportunity are at their schools now developing programs and making opportunities available in education research and service. And one of my dear colleagues, Lois Collins, is still working to help uh, across the, uh, the continent to get individuals to work together to understand that oral health is not just dental health, it's not teeth. It is, it is a, a pandemic uh, uh, savior, really, because we're looking at saliva as a potential um, uh, diagnostic and also as a treatment for the coronavirus, which is, uh, which is on our minds now because we're seeing the development of virology that we had no concept of when I started in, in graduate school. And so I'm very happy to have had this opportunity to be a link. Oh, I, I love links. I mean, I just, I served many years national trends and services and, and, and uh, uh, opportunities for youth because we started programs with the links in Washington, D.C., in the, in the public schools, going back and forth to the schools, seeing that they had supplemental care, but also the loving care and treatment that they could see us there helping in the community and in the friendship is, is one thing, and I love that too, but our ability to serve and the, and the pleasure that you get from service. And that's why I'm still active. I'm back at Howard University, and I hope that I can be a help to our students there, to the faculty there, and also to, the, to dentistry as we look forward into translational science and into community, academic community partnerships with the Sullivan Alliance and also uh, with uh, WAMC, which we are now in alliance with. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And usually these speak too long, so I hope I have it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Dean Singford. And you are truly a role model and mentor to the Lynx as well as to the dental students. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Dr. Farmer Dixon. What is the difference between medical and dental integration and medical and dental collaboration? And also, if you could talk to us a little bit about the collaboration at Meharry between the, the physicians, dentists, and nurses as it relates to the uh, recent pandemic and the COVID-19 uh, testing. Good evening. Thank you so much. 
When we think about medical and dental integration, if we just take the word integration, that we're talking about the mixing of people or groups of, uh, of individuals. But when we expand that, so you can mix people together, but nothing can happen from that. Uh, and so when we talk about collaboration, we're talking about not only putting people together, but you're wanting some outcomes, you're wanting uh, to produce something or create something. And so I think when we're talking about medical and dental uh, collaboration, that is the conversation that we want to have. Um, the saying that the head is connected to the rest of the body and it does impact what happens with the rest of the body. And so as Dr. Sinkford was discussing or mentioning the importance of uh, integrating oral health into overall health, I think that can only happen with medical and dental uh, collaboration. And while the pandemic has really um, demonstrated, you know, the loss of lives, it, it has had an impact on the world, it also gave an opportunity for us at Meharry to enhance the collaboration. And as we address the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The unique thing that we were able to do at Meharry is that um, we had the opportunity to, when the pandemic first started, to um, be a testing site. And it was important for us, it wasn't a question of will we do it, the question was, when do we get started? And that was really important to us because the information that we were, were we receiving was that it was significantly impacting people of color. People of color were dying at a disproportionately higher rate. Uh, dentists and dental offices uh, were shut down. Uh, who would have imagined that uh, just abruptly without any plans, without any preparation, dentistry could not be administered in the, or could not serve the community in the manner in which it was doing on a daily basis, uh, other than maybe emergency or urgent care. And so at Meharry, um, we began uh, collaborating. And so for us, it was, it was really an opportunity for us to, for, for the medical profession to really um, gain an appreciation, a better appreciation of the value that we as dentists uh, could bring. We annually have had oral health days and that involved us working with uh, community partners, um, developing the logistics from um, the time the people come on the campus, uh, where do they go to register? And so we had in the dental school, we had the, the expertise and the experience of planning uh, large events from a logistical standpoint. In addition, um, having a, a public health background, this was not just a medical uh, issue, the pandemic, this was a public health issue. And so approaching it from a public health standpoint. And so the unique thing about Meharry is that the initiatives were led by dentists, myself and uh, the Dean of Students uh, in the School of Dentistry at the time, uh, was also a dentist and a link. And um, using the expertise and the knowledge that we had to bring people together. And so that included not only physicians, nurses, PAs, um, we had um, um, dental assistants, the dental hygienists, we had compliance officers, we had public health staff, we had um, uh, lawyers because we wanted to also look at it from a legal aspect. And so we developed a cohort that began the planning of what is this going to look like? And not just, it was important not just to say, okay, we're going to provide testing, but who are the people that we're going to be testing? Who are the people that need the testing? We partnered with churches because it was important for us to meet the people where they were. And while we were doing testing during the week, we also had to see what are some of the challenges that the community would have. And some of those challenges would be trust. And so Meharry has uh, been around since 1876. We have been a vital part of the community, a trusted uh, resource in the community. And so we knew that especially people of color look to us 
or answers, and they looked to us for guidance. So they saw us as a trusted source. In addition to that, in the, in the particularly in the African American community, churches have served as a backbone and has been a fabric of those communities. And so, being able to partner with churches again gave a, gave the community another entity of having a trusted source. The other component of that was that not only the trust factor, but how do these, uh, because we're at Meharry and they had two other sites in the city, um, could the communities easily uh, get access to those sites? So by going into their communities, we were making it more accessible and more available to them. Also understanding that every, a lot of people work during the week, eight to five, and they could not uh, get to sites to get tested. And so making the uh, availability of testing on Saturdays. And so for us, that was how we approached planning and implementing uh, the COVID testing initiatives. And so it was working with the, the, the local health department in Nashville. And the interesting thing is that we've always known what we're able to do and what our potential has been, but this really gave us an opportunity for other people to see what we were able to do and who we were and how we did things. And in comparison to the initial sites that were established by the city, they were just doing testing. They weren't collecting data. They weren't looking at information uh, from who are the people that are being served? And so they then uh, turned to us for guidance and for expertise to the point that they asked us to then take over and start. This was probably a month and a half in. Uh, Mahara began managing and having oversight of the three uh, sites that were in the city. And so we have, what, we, what started as what we thought might be a few weeks has turned into uh, a year, as we say, next week will be the anniversary of one year of going on this long journey of making certain that we are providing services to people in the community and that we were not only providing the testing to them, but being able to also educate them and answer questions and um, uh, dispel some of the myths uh, as it related to the, um, the virus as well. We have seen over 300,000 um, patients in providing testing, but that also gave us a springboard to be able to administer the vaccine. So we were one of the first groups um, to start administering the vaccine in conjunction with uh, the health department, speaking to uh, groups and to organizations and throughout the community to educate particularly people of color about the, um, the vaccine, the difference in the vaccines, uh, to try and remove some of the myths and concerns that people had that are valid concerns because of history uh, and the, the level of distrust uh, in the, with government agencies and with uh, the, you know, there was the, the concern that this vaccine had been um, developed too fast. And um, uh, so there, there were a lot of concerns and questions that we were able to, to answer. And again, this was with dentists leading this and, and taking charge and leading the, the path and really serving as a guide for the other healthcare professionals and how we logistically plan this out and how we do as much as we can for the community and meet the community where they were so that we could be available accessible to them, but also educating so that they would be acceptable of the services that we were trying uh, to provide. And so we're continuing um, even now the same model that we use uh, with partnering with churches. Interestingly enough, that is a model that is being adopted throughout the city to uh, increase the number of opportunities that individuals have to, to get the vaccine. And so we are still doing the testing, but we have certainly transitioned into uh, the vaccine and are administering the vaccine and using the same approach and same concept to make certain that we can make it as available and as easily accessible as possible to the communities. Well, thank you very much. And we, even though uh, we don't live near you, we thank you for taking up the mantle 
and working with the community and the fact that you form that model, which I'm sure can be used throughout the country because in terms of African-Americans, that is usually the first place that we tend to look for answers and for trust is the church. So partnering with the church seems to make perfect sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Alston, if you could talk to us about uh, what measures has the National Dental Association taken to ensure that patients have safety during the pandemic? And what type of things are your members doing uh, to help their patients overcome some of the vaccination hesitancy uh, that Dr. Farmer Dixon just spoke about? Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be part of this uh, panel today. The questions you ask are very good questions. There is a low infectious disease transmission rate in dental settings, I believe, because it is, it's ingrained in dentists from the time we are in dental school, how to prevent cross-contamination. That is, how to prevent disease microbes from spreading from patients to the dental team, from the dental team to patients, and from patient to patient. We practice what is called standard precautions. Standard precautions are the minimum infection prevention practices that apply to all patients, whether they have the signs and symptoms or have been diagnosed with an infectious disease like HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Patients can transmit the COVID-19 even before they know they have it. So the dental teams are following the standard precautions that we always have plus other precautions against COVID under the guidance of the CDC. For example, staff who experience any COVID-19-like symptoms within the previous 48 hours before they work will stay home until the symptoms have subsided for more than 48 hours. The same goes for patients. The office will contact patients by phone or text or email asking whether or not they have experienced COVID-19-like symptoms. And if they have, the dental office will reschedule the appointment after the patient is symptom-free for more than 48 hours. On the day of your appointment, you'll be asked again if you have any COVID-like symptoms and your temperature will be taken. Dental staff may ask you to come alone and wait in your car until the dentist is ready to see you or in the waiting area, sit at least six feet apart. You'll be asked to keep your mask on until your clinical visit begins and use a hand sanitizer. You'll be given pre-procedural mouth rinses before your dental procedure. The dental staff will do everything possible to limit dental aerosols that are generated during some procedures. You may notice a stronger suction to remove fluids from your mouth and there may be a suction unit close to, but outside of the mouth to catch the aerosols that were not captured by the suction inside of your mouth. Procedures may even be done differently. For example, a teeth cleaning. It may be done um, with a hand scaling rather than an ultrasonic scaling and also without the polish. In addition to the ventilation system and the ceiling, you may see portable HEPA filter uh, machines to help purify the air quickly. The dental team will be wearing different uh, personal protective equipment. All of this, um, I mentioned, uh, it, as I mentioned before, is to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. A lot of thought has been uh, gone into patient safety, and that began long before COVID-19. So you can feel comfortable that your dental team knows how to protect you from being exposed to the coronavirus. And we are committed to staying abreast of all infectious disease protocols. So you also asked um, how we are helping to, um, helping our patients to overcome vaccination uh, hesitancy and how. Well, that's another very good question because the NDA recently did a membership survey and 50% well, 56 actually percent of respondents stated that they treat COVID-19 high-risk patients. So 56% of their population. But surprisingly, only 11% of respondents observed vaccine hesitancy among their patients. And I think that may be because the NDA sends 
our members e-blast regularly. And we offer continuing dental education courses to keep our members up to date on best practices. So we've encouraged our NDA members for a long time to promote vaccines for, um, you know, for example, uh, not just COVID recently, but also the flu vaccine, the shingles vaccine, and the HPV. So NDA members, patients may already be accustomed to getting the encouragement to get vaccines. But that is not to say that the 11% of our member dentists who observe vaccine hesitancy are dismissing it among our patients. Sure, some African-American patients are hesitant to get the vaccine because they don't trust it. But dentists are trusted messengers. Our NDA members are culturally humble. We acknowledge that our patients are the experts of their lives, and we affirm that. Talking to our patients about vaccine hesitancy is an opportunity to share information. For example, we have heard that some eligible patients didn't know the vaccine was free. Letting them know that it was free was indeed all they needed to know to pursue the vaccine. 57% of the respondents to the NDA member survey said that they feel comfortable discussing the vaccine and they take time to discuss it with their patients. Our strategy is to listen to our patients' reasons for being hesitant about the vaccine. We don't dispute what they're feeling. We give them factual information empathetically that is science-based and matched to their oral health literacy levels and our own testimonies about receiving the vaccine. The NDA is going to produce a video called I Got the Shot, showcasing NDA leaders who received the vaccine because as we've said before, we are trusted messengers. And we hope that the video will inspire hesitant patients to go ahead and get the vaccine. Some of our patients have reported their difficulty navigating the vaccine um, scheduling system. And that explains why 16% of the survey respondents actually help their eligible patients make appointments for the vaccine at convenient locations in the community. All in all, our NDA members have found that taking the time to talk to our patients rather than give them a handout that they probably won't, won't read is much more effective. Part of the reason for the NDA member survey was to find out how we could assist our NDA members in promoting the vaccine to their patients and to gather, uh, best, um, uh, to gather best practices that we could share. And I just wanna comment just briefly on uh, teledentistry that is being used by dentists. Um, so we know when uh, dental settings were closed or just limited to emergency or urgent care, dentistry followed medicine and behavioral health. Uh, telehealth was our way of continuing to stay in co contact with our patients and extending access using telephones or virtual software. And these were all uh, HIPAA compliant platforms. More than half of our NDA members who responded to the survey question about teledentistry are using it. And most are using it to triage emergencies and to perform consultations. And this serves, uh, this saves patients the time of traveling to the office for a visit that can be done by phone or on the computer. Uh, the visits are much more uh, efficient for the dental team. And NDA members are also using teledentistry for post-op visits and to provide follow-up care. And they are also using it um, to provide oral hygiene instructions and oral hygiene education. So um, I do believe that teledentistry is not going away. It's only going to become um, uh, used more after the uh, pandemic, because as I said, it's efficient and equitable and it's capable of rendering a quality encounter. So dentists and other members of the dental team are becoming more comfortable using it and insurance companies are starting to see its full potential. It won't substitute for in-person visits in many cases, but it will provide an alternative option in some cases. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you.
you. I appreciate that. Um, I know we're doing a lot of telemedicine as well, and I think it, it really is the wave of the future. And once we get past all the, uh, the COVID craziness, I'm not sure patients will want to go back to, you know, like you said, driving to the office, having to park, having to get off work. So um, I do think that teledentistry is like telemedicine. It's definitely part of the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jackson, if you, if you could talk to us now about the vulnerable and the at-risk populations <clears throat> that are challenged with multiple comorbidities, and a number of our speakers have talked about the fact that uh, oral health is, is really total health and how your total health can affect your oral health. So if you could speak to us especially about the, the correlation of diabetes and hypertension as well as cardiovascular disease, as well as um, what, 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 what impact would it have on dental care if patients are really more aware of this information and how do you think going forward we can spread that information to them uh, both to us in the community as well as uh, you teaching your students well thank you all for uh, inviting me this evening to um, speak with this esteemed group um, as far as everyone is all already mentioned about how the oral cavity is the window to general health and um, with the comorbidities existing, the uh, poor oral health and periodontal disease is actually an infectious process that's going on inside of the mouth. And with that infectious process, there are um, uh, substances that are released into the bloodstream as a reaction to the infectious process that, again, um, impacts the severity of the comorbidities. And so if you have periodontal disease, which is um, uh, um, causing the, the bone to um, deteriorate around the teeth and uh, inflammation in the gingiva and, and um, um, gums, it does re, uh, travel throughout the systems to the lungs for, for pulmonary uh, complications through to cardiovascular complications um, and um, for diabetes uh, with the insulin, um, lack of in insulin having high uh, glycemic count can cause more of that infection to grow in the mouth. And so uh, it just is interconnected in that way. Um, and um, just simple periodontal treatment of uh, visits to the dentist having uh, good oral hygiene practices can lower those substances, which are called cytokines. And uh, when you decrease the level in the bloodstream, you uh, can decrease the severity of those comorbidities. Uh, patients need to know that even a healthy patient by having um, good oral hygiene practices, they can maintain good health uh, because of uh, the lesser a concentration of these uh, inflammatory substances in the bloodstream. Uh, as far as with our students, um, you know, we really uh, start with the education of, of our students in this manner through um, their uh, first year in dental school where the curriculum focuses on the biomedical sciences and, um, and how they interrelate with the clinical sciences and uh, just preaching those, um, those concepts and constantly reinforcing those um, issues with the students as they uh, begin patient care. Throughout their patient care, they're taught to take the uh, medical history and um, then um, a list the medications um, and realizing how uh, they interrelate and impact the oral cavity. There are uh, at least a um, hundred conditions or more that have oral implications. And students are well-versed in uh, diagnosing and treatment planning oral conditions, knowing what is, um, what is considered a normal oral cavity and, and recognizing where pathology may um, be present and, and knowing how to refer those, pa those patients to get the proper uh, care that may catch some comorbidities early in, the, in its progress. Um, also, um, 
the um, the students also are taught, uh, you know, pharmacology as well as uh, oral pathology and uh, treat diagnosis and treatment planning to be able to um, manage patients with these comorbidities. They uh, take um, bl blood pressure. Um, they um, check glucose values, uh, A1C, uh, and are very uh, much in. Uh, it's very much integrated into their clinical exposure. Um, uh, so, uh, is anything else? I don't believe there's. That's all I have, really. Thank you. Um, I guess I just, I wanted to sort of maybe expand a little bit if you could talk about, um, is there anything different in the way you teach your students now uh, in relation to, uh, dare I say pandemics, as in hopefully we're talking about one in our lifetime. Well, uh, with um, COVID-19, um, you can, they, it, it, Research has shown that because of the, um, if you have poor oral hygiene, it can increase that uh, level of cytokines that's in the bloodstream that will cause those patients to go on to the ventilators and things of that nature and have a more severe case. Also, there's been known to have aspiration from the oral cavity into the lungs for um, pulmonary, um, uh, I guess, uh, pulmonary dif um, difficulties and um, having more severe reactions to the uh, COVID-19 virus. And so just in general, if we can keep down the infectious process in the mouth, it will uh, translate to less of a severe reaction throughout the uh, entire body with um, the comorbidities that may exist. And so we have to preach and also with, not only with our patients, but with our fellow uh, healthcare providers, the importance of, of uh, dental care and oral health care, and that uh, we are a vital part of the uh, collaborative team that can uh, provide um, uh, good general health for the patients, not just uh, uh, for, um, oral health or, or um, want to say what they may think of us as a drill and fill type of, of uh, profession. We are really physicians of the oral cavity and, oral and, and of the um, head and neck and uh, can really contribute to um, many of the systemic conditions such as pregnancy, such as diabetes, such as um, uh, pulmonary cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular uh, difficulties because uh, these uh, this uh, fossa of infection in the mouth, if it's not cared for, um, you know, extends itself throughout the body. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Fields, uh, if you could please talk to us about Colgate. Colgate has done a lot of amazing things in the community. Uh, as well as with their Lynx partnership. So if you could talk to us a little bit about the Children's Oral Health Program and how for the past 10 years, um, how that has sort of pivoted and grown throughout, um, throughout your tenure. Yes, yes, thank you. First of all, I wanna thank um, uh, uh, the Lynx Incorporated for actually establishing a national oral health initiative. And I, uh, we appreciate that um, as Colgate and as many of and many of the esteemed uh, partners that are are on this on this panel, the esteemed experts, we have partnered with them to actually deliver Colgate Bright Smiles Bright Futures. Um, as you know, and many of you have heard me say this before, we believe that everyone deserves a future they can smile about. So we've been championing. Um, optimism and healthy smiles since the, the first establishment of Colgate. But 30 years ago, we established Colgate Bright Smiles, Bright Futures under the leadership, under the leadership of Dr. Marsha Butler. And with this program, we provided um, 
children around the world and in the U.S. with information on how they can maintain a healthy smile, them and their families, um, um, either through education, important education, awareness, uh, 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 visual screenings, and um, treatment referral. And right now this program is in uh, uh, 80 countries and 37 languages around the world. But um, Colgate Bright Smiles, Bright Futures has uh, really uh, had a huge foothold in the U.S. where I managed for the past uh, 23 years um, in uh, bringing information to our most vulnerable communities, uh, uh, our under access and underserved communities. And um, I want to, again, thank the Lynx Incorporated, the National Dental Association, and all the players around this um, this conference call who have made that happen. Um, but as you know, one of the, even though it's a multi-complex program, multifaceted program, Bright Smiles, Bright Future, one of the signature parts of Bright Smiles, Bright Futures is our community outreach with our mobile dental van programs. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, it, um, it was almost devastating to us. Um, it was devastating to everybody. And um, because our mobile van programs actually go into schools, to churches, to religious centers, to festivals, to fairs, Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA's, um, to bring important information. And now we're at a, a quarantine, a national stay at home. How do we operate? Well, the good thing is having those connections to the community, partnering with folks like the Lynx Incorporated and many other organizations because we were trusted. We were there, we were grassroots. Um, uh, many of the community let us know what they liked about our product and what they did not like about our product. So we were able to pivot. Our teams were agile across the United States and North America. Um, and we were able to bring much needed information, not just uh, 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 not just oral care, but the other personal hygiene um, products that people needed to be safe during um, uh, during this pandemic. In 2020, we mobilized our dental vote, dental van programs to distribute uh, 1.4 million bars of soap, soap, and uh, other hygiene products such as dishwashing liquid, toothpaste, and toothbrushes um, through uh, the school districts, through Feeding America. We were able to get into those communities um, and bring this type of these products to the community so that they could uh, sort of bridge it through the, 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 the really critical times, the early months of the pandemic. Again, champion op op optimism, understanding that uh, oral health was not the only need that our community had, that they had the other personal hygiene needs that they needed. And we sort of pulled that together. Um, we pivoted to digital. We were gonna go digital anyhow. So now this just sort of accelerated our access to being digital. Um, and so we converted the van visits into virtual van visits. We were still engaging children and families. We're still delivering important information. Um, we're, we're delivering a way that makes them optimistic uh, that we're talking about the whole body, the health and wellness of, of everything from nutrition um, uh, to physical activity, all the things that we needed to get done. And um, with Bright Smiles, Bright Futures, that 30 year legacy that uh, 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 the Bright Smiles part that was established by Dr. Uh, Butler is definitely um, the springboard we need to move into the future um, under uh, Dr. Jillian Barclay. So as we move forward, um, as we continue to champion optimism, as we continue to remind everyone that everyone deserve a future they can smile about. We are so happy to partner with the Lynx, the National Dental Association, uh, uh, Howard University, Meharry, to make these types of things happen and move forward on the ground. Um, as um, uh, 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 Dr. Um, Nikki Martin said, and as Dr. Uh, uh, Sheree Dixon also said, that uh, we are trusted 
We are a trusted source. We're a trusted entity. And um, when we're dealing with vulnerable, vulnerable communities, this is key. So we are completely happy. Um, we are not happy about the pandemic, but we were happy that we were able to pivot, that those connections on the community were so key in helping us to reach in 2020 over 20 million children and families, despite the stay at home and the safeguarding that we had to do for the pandemic. So I think, um, I think that, uh, 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 I think that we're all saying the same thing, that being a trusted source um, is key to uh, having success and delivering important information and services during the pandemic. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And yes, I agree that is true. Um, I personally, as in my short tenure as the HHS chair, I have really appreciated the partnership with Colgate and we've done some amazing things together uh, and I'm sure we will continue for many years. So I'd like to, first of all, thank all of our panelists, but uh, before we go, we're going to open it up to questions. So if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, please put them in the chat and we will take a look at them and have our panelists answer them. Um, at this point, um, we do have a few questions and this is really a question for the panel. Anyone can answer this. Uh, the disproportionate rate um, of death rate rather among black Americans around the country from COVID-19 has revealed persistent inequities in healthcare and need for solutions. So we've talked about, everyone has pretty much mentioned that we know there are disparities. Uh, they're not new. Uh, they have been highlighted by the pandemic. Um, but what do we do about them? Pandemic or no, uh, how do we move forward aggressively as a community in terms of um, meeting this challenge and trying to overcome it so that our children and our grandchildren won't be sitting here saying the same things about inequity in healthcare and dental care. Well, I'll make a quick comment. I think we need to do everything we can to strengthen our nation's public health system. This will have a major impact on the health of our citizens to improve health literacy among our population so that they will know the things that they can do and must do to protect their health. And finally, to increase the number and percentage of minorities who are health professionals, not only physicians, but dentists, uh, physical therapists, pharmacists, et cetera. We need to be sure that uh, the increased awareness of the nation translates into long-term solutions. So that's everyone's responsibility. So I think that's the opportunity and the challenge that all of us have. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. Would anyone else like to comment? I'd like to echo. Yes. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I defer to you, Dean. <laughs> I'd like to echo what, what uh, Dr. Sullivan has said. And I think that you know, some of the, the things that we know are happening in our communities, obesity and um, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and some of those things can be controlled by um, uh, diet and exercise. And we know a lot of times, especially in our vulnerable communities, uh, those are food deserts. Um, and not every, these populations, not everyone can afford to have a membership at um, a local gym. But being able to teach and educate on things that they can do at home uh, to promote exercising and encouraging. If we just start with encouraging and promoting um, several years ago, uh, Tom Joyner had to take, take your loved one to the doctor and making certain that uh, our black men especially are going to the doctor uh, once a year, but, but all of our people are going to the doctor and getting that, that physical exam. And from a dental perspective, a lot of times uh, vulnerable communities, they, 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 they can't afford to go um, to the dentist. And when they do, it's because they are in pain but educating them and, and identifying resources. In many communities, there are uh, healthcare, uh, federally qualified health centers or community centers that will provide dental services and will provide it on what's called a sliding fee scale that's based upon their income or having free services. And so making certain that our communities know about those resources so that we can assist them and not just telling them you have 
cavities, but educating them on ways that they, things that they can be doing at home to help prevent that and uh, helping them to find uh, resources and identify resources so that it can be more preventive versus being reactive. Thank you. Did someone else want to comment? Yeah, I'll, I yeah. also want to think, uh, say that, um, you know, training dental students, uh, many of the dental uh, colleges in the nation have student externships that go out to these um, um, underserved areas to, to reach some of the populations that wouldn't have access to care. And that is uh, very important that we are out in the communities and go to these underserved areas. Um, and, and I know Howard, as far as uh, the uh, COVID um, testing and vaccines have been reaching out to the underserved areas in Washington, D.C., partnering with um, the Department of Health. But many of the state-supported schools have um, clinics that are located in areas that they can reach more uh, uh, of the underserved patients. Dr. Uh, doctor. I, I think our, our schools serve as a part of a safety net for care yes. to be underserved. And the medical schools, dental schools, hospitals, et cetera, are, are part of that net to individuals that cannot seek care in the private sector. Yes. We, our students are a part, that's a part of their academic programs, but also that we reach out to our alumni to, to expand their opportunities in offices and FQACs and also in the Indian Health Service clinics and clinics that are satellite clinics that nobody really knows about unless you're in the state that can get some funds to provide the, these, those services. So our dental schools, the educational programs and the schools need to be compensated for that care that is delivered to those patients who otherwise would not be served instead of just it being a a handout kind of thing. It could be a service that is, is really a part of the public health system for this country. We can do it. When I was a, a student in Washington, D.C., we had, had visits to our schools. We, the children went to the schools to get examined. We had dental hygienists in the schools. You had a, had a, had a pink slip if you had a problem, and you had a white slip if, if you were okay. We, we followed up with the care. So I don't know where we lost that ability to meet the oral health needs early and to develop uh, uh, preventive habits in the children. Uh, our, our team went to uh, Asia last year and the kids in school were brushing their teeth in school because it's, a, it's something that's built in. So we, we can't wait until we have dental care. We can start teaching at a lower level we can start teaching in the schools where we already have uh, an, an infrastructure, and we can also expand the use of our allied people, especially our dental allies, our dental um, hygienists, our, uh, and our dental therapists. So a whole new cadre of individuals are being developed for dental therapists, and we we need those in our dental teams. The dentists can't do everything that we expect them to do, especially in those areas that Dr. Solomon is talking about. But we have no care. We've got over 5,000 areas in this country that have no absence or very little dental care. The Public Health Service tells us that. That's not new data. So I think with the, since we have schools in many of those areas, if we would uh, extend those uh, services and activities so that we extend, um, extend the responsibilities for all health care beyond the mouth, as we have extended it for other diseases in the rest of the body. Okay, Dr. Alston, did you want to comment also? Uh, yes, I would. Actually, everyone has said everything I wanted to say, <laughs> so I said it very well. I would just add uh, my perspective that I believe that Black Americans are at a higher risk to dying from COVID, not because of race, but because of racism. And, you know, we talk about things that we can do on a personal level, but there is, there is racism. There's historical racism and disparities that um, have kept us in poverty, uh, denied us um, educational equity. And I believe that our vulnerable, marginalized Black communities 
need access to healthy foods, to housing, employment, mm -hmm. transportation, and quality education. And I do believe that the uh, Biden-Harris administration is committed to moving the needle on disparities and ac access to care. But, you know, with the current hyper-polarized uh, U.S. politics, mm -hmm. we have to commit to forging and fortifying partnerships and coalitions with like-minded organizations and, uh, you know, to pressure the decision makers to support effective policy changes to tackle the social determinants to achieve health equity. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that we're working in the communities, we also need to be lobbying um, the decision makers to make the policy changes. Mm -hmm. Very true, thank you. Um, Dr. Sullivan, this one's for you. Uh, one of our guests says, I would love to hear your thoughts on how the separation of dental and mainstream health insurance negatively impacts the access to health care and or access to dental care. Mm -hmm. And do you think they will, the two will ever catch up where dental care will be a part, dental insurance will be a part of overall insurance for health? Well, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, when Medicare was uh, being debated by the Congress back in the mid 60s, both the AMA and the American Dental Association resisted um, mm -hmm. coverage. The dentists were more successful in blocking coverage uh, than the physicians were. Mm -hmm. But I think with um, uh, the Affordable Care Act of 2010 and other activities, we're beginning to close that gap. But we still have too many instances where there's lack of insurance coverage for dental care, and that uh, contributes to people not receiving the care that they need. With the great understanding that oral care is part of total care, uh, hopefully we'll see more health insurance and more coverage uh, of dental mm -hmm. care so that indeed uh, everyone will get it. This is important and I think all of us should support it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fields, this is for you. Uh, we've had a couple of people ask, uh, how can an organization partner with Colgate Bright Smiles Bright Future? Come on, come, come on. Okay. All right. Okay. There we go. Um, uh, partnering with Bright Smiles Bright, we partner with so many communities, and thank you for asking that question. Um, we partner with so many communities and organizations to make things happen, and um, um, we're so um, uh, to the point where um, the, the more the merrier. Um, of course, you can always reach out to um, uh, uh, Colgate at um, our, our, our headquarters, but um, I think um, most of our um, connections are right there in the communities where you are. Schools, churches, organizations like the Lynx are probably your first way to connect with uh, Bright Smiles, Bright Futures because they know the community and they are there on the ground. Um, but you can always write to Colgate and we can always get you some information and, um, and connect with you. Um, like I said, it's it, the community is key to us reaching the millions of children and families we have each year. And it's a very important, um, it is probably one of the strongest pillars in our strategic plan. Okay. Um, is, is there, um, they should go directly to Colgate's website? Yes. Okay. www.colgatebsbf, Bright Smiles, Bright Futures, dot com. And you, and in, 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 in that um, uh, webpage, it'll tell you how to volunteer. If you want to volunteer with us, it'll tell you how to um, get special educational things. If you want to share them with your family materials, um, that if you want to share them with your family, we'll have those available to you. But more importantly, uh, 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 we want to hear from the community. And in fact, we have something going on right now um, so that your children and family can demonstrate what it is to smile, what it is that brings us, brings a smile, what it is to be optimistic, what it is to connect um, oral health to overall health and wellness. And that's our Bright Smiles, 
Kids Awards. So just go right online. You can find that. You can tuck into it very quickly. Or if you want to host one of our, our teams in your community, go right online to our www.colgatebsbf.com. I'm shameless in advertising that. <laughs> no, no, it works. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I would like again just to thank our esteemed panel. Thank you so much. This has been great information. And I know that not only the Lynx members, but our entire Facebook family has gained some knowledge about personal health, about uh, family health, things that they can do going forward in their communities, working with dental schools, working with Colgate, uh, working with their local dentists. So again, a special thanks uh, to Dr. Sullivan. I appreciate your time to our national president, Dr. Kimberly Jeffries Leonard, as well as to all of our deans, Dr. Singford, Dr. Cherie Farmer Dixon, Dr. Pamela Alston, Dr. Andrea Jackson, and Ms. Fields. Uh, so again, this has been our first national oral health uh, town hall, oral health matters during COVID and beyond. And I appreciate everyone joining us. I'm Dr. Nicolette Martin, the National HHS Chair for the Lynx Incorporated. Thank you so much and good night. And thank you. Good night, thank you. Thank you, good night. Good night, good night, bye.